Actually, let me start right now. There. Yeah. So we are also broadcast the, this on YouTube. So if you make questions during the presentations, this will also be, be live there. The YouTube channel, it's the, it's the, the uh, let me copy for you the, the link here, but it's on the, the university, the our department uh, webpage. Oh, you place it here already. Okay. Yeah, let me see if I'm missing something. Questions can be doing doing the presentation in the end. We are live there. Keep your, your mic mute. And I think that's it, right? So let's let's go. Let's go for, for the show. And we are we have roughly one hour. And now I, I have Shiko here to, to introduce you to the large audience. Thanks again. Thank you, Diego. Well, welcome everyone, and it is an absolute pleasure of mine to introduce Scott. Scott Hill is an associate professor and senior research fellow at the Oxford Internet Institute at the University of Oxford. He's the director of research at MEDAN and a fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. His cross-disciplinary research develops and applies new techniques in um, the computational sciences to social science questions and he puts the results into practice with industry and policy partners. He's particularly interested in multilingual natural language processing, computational social linguistics, mobilization and collective action, agenda setting and misinformation, and has a strong track record in building tools and teaching programs that enable wider access to new methods and forms of data. Personally, I've worked with Scott before, and now I'm really eager to hear what he's been up to lately, but I trust that it's going to be really exciting to hear what he's got to say today. Thank you for coming, Scott. Thank you, Chico, and thank you everyone for coming. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. I'm gonna be talking about some of the work that I'm doing in partnership uh, with Medan, this technology nonprofit that builds tools for global journalism and translation. Um, and particularly thinking about misinformation response through claim matching, tip lines, and collaboration. Uh, as mentioned, feel free to interrupt. Uh, I know we're streaming, so if you don't want, uh, if, if you want to ask a question to, to interrupt and, and for clarification, uh, feel free to drop it into the chat as well if you don't want to appear on the stream or just unmute and, and shout out. Um, you know, I think the more interactive that we make this, the better. So, I don't need to, to sort of stress that there's misinformation online. I think, you know, the last 18 months have, have really put this into the spotlight. Um, that being said, I think there's so much um, out there that it's, it's helpful to try to um, separate these things out, right? And so, um, full fact, the UK's independent fact-checking um, organization has a really nice uh, pagoda of harms shown here on the slide and you know what there's probably a lot of things out there that correspond to this first uh, first one you know it's, it's not really harmful it's something wrong uh, but it's you know not going to cause anyone anyone trouble we're all well acquainted uh, with that sort of challenge on the internet and so you know the idea that I don't know, UNESCO has voted our national anthem the, the best in the world. Um, not true, but not particularly harmful. I think some of the challenges come as you work your way down that pagoda where we see uh, leaders contesting elections or uh, phishing scams that are going after economic uh, sort of consequence. And of course, um, health is one example of risk to life. I think there's um, other things that fit into this um, sort of pagoda as well that, that are emerging issues that we're starting to take a lot more note of, things like climate change uh, denial, for instance, as well. So platforms aren't sitting idly by. They are trying to be uh, to do something or at least seem to be doing something. And, um, you know, so, so on unencrypted platforms, things like Facebook or Twitter, um, the platforms can do some things, right? They can can look for unusual spreading patterns, things that might be coordinated in authentic behavior. Um, they can look at reactions to content and, and sometimes controversy. I'm working with a 
a startup called Ocode that uh, is using controversy as a, a window into uh, finding potential misinformation. Things before as they become popular, um, right, can be can be subject to review if if there's a question about them. And of course, um, keywords, topics, previous fact checks can also be uh, can be useful. We've seen YouTube recently uh, say that they're going to be uh, taking down vaccine misinformation, or I think um, Flickr, I think it was in the past, um, took a, a, a an approach where they just said, "Look, we're not going to allow uh, searches for this health topic." Full stop. We just won't return uh, results for it, and so. There are different ways that this can happen on on unencrypted platforms and you know here's one example of that on Facebook where a post has been fact checked. Um, and then Facebook is presenting this sort of screen to it before you interact to say hey uh, a fact checker has checked this thing or something very similar uh, to this and it's been found to be false, we want you to know that before you interact with it. Um, of course, that sort of algorithmic intervention is much harder when we think about end to end encrypted platforms, and this is where a lot of traffic is starting to go. Uh, platforms like Line, Signal, WhatsApp, Telegram, uh, right, are end to end encrypted, and so not even the platform operator knows uh, the content that's being passed around. And this is one of the, the sort of challenges that I've been working on um, in collaboration with Midan. And Midan is this nonprofit that's building open source uh, technology. And one of the, uh, or probably the flagship product that Midan builds is called Check. And it facilitates an idea of, of a tip line on end to end encrypted platforms. These are basically simply accounts to which people can send in information uh, that they see as they're as they're working on that platform and search for existing fact checks or to request uh, a human fact check of that content. And I'll show a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. But uh, there's now 18 uh, different fact checking organizations using Medan software to run these tip lines on WhatsApp and other platforms. Um, across the globe. This slide's a little bit out of date, but it gives a flavor of, of some of those organizations. And so what does this look like? Um, because I'm going to be talking in the rest of the presentation on two studies. One, looking at the types of content that come into tip lines and how well uh, they capture misinformation on these platforms. And then in the second, um, thinking about natural language processing methods to group similar content. And so I just want to give an example of, of what this looks like so you have a better idea of where the data is coming from. Um, so, you know, if I'm a person on, on WhatsApp in this instance, I could uh, reach out to this phone number that belongs to the fact checker, say, hey, I want to fact check this thing. Um, and then I can, you know, forward on a message I've seen and say, okay, I've, I've seen this thing um, about coronavirus and, and alkalinity or pineapples. Is it true? I really want to know. And this is all automated. The bot will, will ingest that content, and then it will go and look in the existing fact checks. And if there's a match, it'll be returned straight away uh, to the user. If there's not a match, it'll be enqueued into a system where fact checkers can start to look at the content coming in through the tip lines and identify things that might be worth fact checking. And part that's done by by looking at things like well how many requests have each item uh, received how many similar uh, items are there and so I'll be talking a bit later in the presentation on how we can group similar content um, because that can be one signal that can be important in determining what to fact check this is a demo account so everything is is only requested a few times but in practice there tends to be a few content items that are requested a lot uh, and then a long time tail as as you might expect um, and then this is less uh, less pertinent to this group but a fact checker can walk through um, the interface create a, a fact check illustrate it and create that card that ultimately goes back to the end user on whatsapp telegram um, uh, viber line whichever platform uh, the tip line is connected to so all right 
being an academic, my question, of course, was, well, are these things any good, <laughs> right? What content's actually coming in uh, to tip lines? And is it worth worth the time of fact-checking organizations to even, uh, even do this? And so we had a fortuitous opportunity. Um, the first tip line that Medan Software was facilitating was in spring 2019, and it was uh, in India around the Indian elections run by um, a group called Proto. And it turned out at the same time, uh, a researcher at MIT, Karen Garamella, um, now at Rutgers University, had also been studying WhatsApp and the Indian elections, but using a very different methodology. Um, Kieran and his team were scraping public groups on WhatsApp. They would look on the web for join links into these groups, and then they would join those and uh, scrape all of the, the messages coming in. And so that gave us an opportunity. We thought, wow, um, we can actually look at this and compare these two data sets. We can ask, how do tip lines, um, and this tip line in particular run by Proto, compare to the content that's circulating in these large public groups? And in India, these public groups are, uh, are quite prevalent. Uh, I think most uh, Indian colleagues that I talk to, you know, they're all members of, of multiple groups. Um, and, and lots of content is flowing through them. And so we wanted to see what's the sort of overlap um, and in general, what is the types of content that are coming in uh, to tip lines? So I'll walk through these, but um, the big takeaways here were that we, we did find a good percentage of the popular content in the public groups also appeared in the tip lines. The most popular content actually appeared in the the tip lines first, which was, was quite unexpected. Um, and I won't talk about it today, but in, in the full paper, there's more information looking at how this compares to uh, just fact checks written by other organizations and tweets that were referenced by those fact checking organizations as containing misinformation. And we found that there's a much higher overlap uh, between the tip line and the public groups on WhatsApp than either of those and the, the sort of uh, fact checks that were coming out of uh, fact checking organizations at the time in India. So a little bit uh, on data and methods. I've mentioned this was in the spring of 2019, March to June in particular. Um, and the elections in India took place over multiple days, in fact, over multiple weeks. Um, of course, Matt Imagine the, the scale of the, the exercise in India, given the population. So it's, it's a six week election um, and the, the tip line encompasses that plus a, a period of time uh, just before and after that voting period. And uh, yeah, I've mentioned we have the, the WhatsApp data from the tip line uh, from public groups. And then I won't talk uh, today too much about this, but there's also content from from ShareChat, a really large image sharing uh, social media platform in India, and then claim uh, uh, content coming out of fact checking organizations and the tweets that they referenced as well. So the, the first thing probably to note is that the tip lines naturally received much less content than um, this scraped public groups data set, uh, right? So we can see here, it's sort of 90,000 text messages, 50,000 images into the tip line um, and almost uh, in order of magnitude uh, larger than that for uh, public groups, 670,000 and 1.3 million uh, text and image items. But of course, the, the tip line might also be a little bit more targeted. People are only asked to forward in content, right? Whereas the public groups data set simply contains all messages that are, are in any of these large um, public groups that were found. And so to or in order to compare these uh, data sets, of course, we need a way to identify similar content across them. For images, we use an algorithm from uh, Facebook that was open source called PDQ uh, image hashing. It's a perceptual hash which means that even if you resize the image, uh, brighten it, darken it, um, save it as a different format, whatever, the hash will still end up being very similar uh, to, uh, to another image without those changes. And so we're able to group uh, similar images using that. And then for text similarity- Does that include text overlays as well? Would, would the image hashes be similar for images with overlay text? 
Yeah, as long as the, the text isn't a large portion of the image. So I would say in practice, um, things like memes with, uh, with you know, a similar central picture and a little text on the top and bottom end up getting pretty similar hashes. Um, where there's, you know, really a, like the whole image is text or something, then those end up uh, uh, changing as, as the text changes naturally. But it, it really has more to do with how much of the image is, uh, is text, if you like. Um, and then the text similarity itself, uh, not, not text in image, but text in um, native text. Uh, I'll talk more about that similarity algorithm uh, in, in the second half of the presentation. So the first question we were looking at um, was how effective are tip lines uh, for this? What's the sort of overlap? And we wanted to know about coverage, the timeliness, and particularly how popular and, and less popular content may be featured. So uh, the headline sort of figure is that as things were, were more popular in the public groups, we captured a greater percentage of them in the tip lines. And so um, of images that were shared at least 100 times in these public groups, two thirds of them appeared in the tip line. And for messages where we had you know, at least 100 uh, instances of very similar text messages, we'd see about, you know, about a quarter of those coming in uh, to the tip line as well, if there were at least 100 copies. It's worth noting that tip lines also captured content that didn't appear um, in the public groups at all. And so something like 10% of the messages uh, coming into the tip line never appeared in the public groups uh, at all. So it's, it's not that either of these is sort of a ground truth of, of the content circulating in India around the election. Um, it's simply that they're both windows into an, an ultimately unknown uh, ground truth for what content is, is there. Now, it's good, of course, to have uh, content, but there's also this question about timing. How quickly uh, does the content come in? And this was quite a surprise uh, to me. If, if we looked at, say, the images uh, overall, um, of all the images that, that came into both the tip line and, um, and the public groups, we had about 60% um, about of them actually came into the tip lines first. Uh, but what's really surprising is that if we looked at the most popular images, the top 10% of them, uh, then something like 80% of those images came into the tip lines before we saw them in the public groups. And I don't have a, a full explanation for why that is, but I have some speculation that I'm, I'm happy to share um, later. But I, I think this has a lot to do with how content spreads on WhatsApp. And we don't have the same... Um, uh, you know, the sort of same dynamics that you might see on, on a platform like Twitter or Facebook where you have big uh, pages or um, you have, uh, you know, accounts with, with millions of followers uh, that can really uh, broadcast that content. So I think we're seeing a very different dynamic of some of this spread. And with text messages uh, and URLs, um, this is a bit of a messy plot, but it's a similar, similar story if, you know, the top... Uh, 10% of, of all the text messages that we saw, something like 90% of them um, are appearing on, on the tip line uh, before they appear in the public groups. So that was a great um, sort, of, sort of discovery that we are getting a, a good fraction of content and, and often very quickly. Um, but the second question we had is like, well, what is this content that's overlapping? Uh, what are the things coming into tip lines uh, generally? And so I just want to give a flavor of, of that as well, so you can appreciate some of the content. These were three of the top images, or these were the three top images coming in uh, to the tip lines. These were all fact-checked and found to be false. Uh, so one's a, a circular about an alleged terrorist plot, uh, something about Pakistani flags being raised in a rally, and then a bunch of doctored uh, TV news screenshots. So those were sort of give you some of the idea of, of content um, in the tip lines. Across all those images, we clustered them and then uh, just chose random examples from each cluster to get an idea of, of what that looked like. And one area I was surprised in is actually there's a good collection of um, pictures of newspaper articles or circulars and other uh, offline media that people are taking photos of, they're, uh, they're circulating in, in WhatsApp and then being flagged up 
uh, in the tip lines as well. Um, but you can see infographics, uh, things like those um, TV news um, headlines, often, often doctored, I have to say, uh, and then other uh, photos and such. On the text side, so we had about 90,000 uh, text messages. When we clustered those, we, we looked uh, at clusters that had at least five items. And we had a, a journalist who had actually worked covering the, um, uh, the, Hindi, the Indian elections. And then we, uh, we had that journalist analyze these text clusters. So um, I have a question here about whether the um, the newspaper articles were, that were fall, or you were shown, were they false or they doctored? Not necessarily, um, but some of them were. So, you know, some of the things were, were sort of outlandish headlines. Um, I think in the, the sort of media landscape in India, there's a lot of um, very local uh, presses. A lot of them don't even have um, uh, websites or, or internet presence. So actually, you know, I think these were, were people sort of sharing these, these very local um, press um, newspaper clippings and such. And yes, yeah, some of them uh, were false, some were not. Um, but I just wanted, that was sort of the flavor of things people were sending in. Um, some more of what, they, what the crowd, if you like, were, um, were possibly concerned about as potentially misleading. Not everything coming in, of course, was found to be uh, misleading. And, and some things just couldn't be fact-checked uh, uh, by the team as well. So I don't know the the actual uh, status of all the items in there. Um, within the text messages, we were able to go back, we re-annotated uh, some of these with this journalist I was mentioning. And uh, there we found that um, there were, were sort of um, a number of things, election related uh, um, claims being made that were, were definitely fact checkable, um, but other claims as well. So these, um, these were all the clusters with claims that were, were fact checkable. Some of them were not about the election, uh, but they were about um, other aspects. Say, um, one that was popular here <laughs> was this thing going around saying, "Oh, if uh, you know, depending on how many check marks there are on your your WhatsApp message, uh, you know, if there's four check marks, uh, that means that the government has seen it or, or something, or they changed." a certain color uh, the government has looked at your whatsapp account um, false not true but these were the other types of claims that were going on um, the largest one in in the text message was this cluster um, around a, a quote unquote tender vote um, and, and some misleading information about how to vote the other things were um, were more related to uh, the candidates in, in the election, um, as you'd expect. But yeah, this is an example of, of one of the pieces of content uh, in that uh, cluster all around uh, the election and, and tender voting. Um, and uh, I gave this uh, the UNESCO example uh, declaring a, a country's national anthem the world's best. That was actually legitimate, uh, uh, not, not true, but a, a real piece of content going around during the Indian elections uh, was that. <laughs> so, all right, what are some of the implications of this? Um, one, one thing is that fact checkers are actually a really important part um, of this approach. Uh, you know, one of the, one significant uh, group of clusters was all around people following up on fact check requests. They said, hey, I sent you that thing I haven't heard back yet. Or, ooh, thanks for the fact check. Do you support another language, um, you know, beyond Hindi and English, which were the two that, um, uh, that Proto were using in this project. And so people were really engaged with, with the tip line. And I don't think we would have gotten the same response if I had simply gone as an academic and said, hey, we have this research project, you know, can you, can you send us some data, uh, send us things you're seeing. No, I, you know, I think it's really um, exciting to be able to work in collaboration uh, with fact checkers. And I think these sorts of tip lines offer a, an exciting um, opportunity from a, a user perspective. Look, you can uh, opt in, you forward in content as you want. Um, you know, in contrast to, to other research approaches that are maybe uh, scraping public groups, uh, this is, you know, more of an opt-in uh, approach. And for fact checkers, this is an opportunity to sort of discover uh, new content. And, you know, in the end, the fact that we were, were getting the most popular content, a good fraction of it at least, uh, in a timely manner, I think has some, 
some you know good omens for um, the types of interventions that can be possible on this. I don't think this is the only answer for end-to-end -end encrypted platforms, but I think it's one piece of a complicated puzzle. So I did hand wave uh, a little bit and said, oh, well, you know, we, we match similar text items. So I want to dive into that a little bit. And uh, this is based on a paper uh, that came out at the ACL uh, annual meeting earlier this year. Uh, and it's work in, in collaboration with Ashkan Kazimi, um, Kieran Garamella, Devin Gaffney, uh, and me. So um, again, you, you maybe get this sense that human fact checking is you know, high quality, uh, but it's often time consuming, uh, expensive. You can't do that much of it. And so how do we get it to scale? And one approach to that is to recognize that misinformation is often repeated, right? So if we can find um, you know, a piece of misinformation, once it's fact checked once, ideally we wanna attach that fact check to every other uh, piece of content that has that same claim. And so this goes back to that, uh, that example of alkaline foods, pineapple, COVID. Um, this is a false claim that, that I think we saw you know, over 100 times, probably in uh, at least a dozen languages across different tip lines um, in, in the last year or so. And so you know, as soon as that's fact checked once, ideally, we'd like to be able to serve that same fact check out, uh, again, as different variations of this claim come in. And uh, more broadly, being able to group these allow us to understand prevalence. You know, is, is this sort of one piece of content someone's sending in, or is this actually something that looks like it's becoming really popular and therefore might be uh, something that a fact checker wants to dig into? So um, we, we thought about how could we best match this different content. And in this paper, we end up training a new uh, large language model. So you'll have heard of things like BERT, uh, for instance, a transformer model. Um, XLMR, uh, XLML, XLM Roberta, is a, a sort of extension of the BERT family. And it's a multilingual model. Um, but um, it turns out that all these embeddings, they're not aligned across languages. So what we need to do is um, both train the model to do semantic similarity, uh, and then also train the model to be able to do that across languages. And I'll talk about those two tasks. As we were preparing this, we, we looked at two existing models, uh, one from Facebook uh, research, Laser, and one from Google uh, called LaBase, or Language Agnostic uh, BERT Sentence Encoder. And we found that both of these didn't have great performance when it came uh, to lower resource languages. You know, they were fine in English, um, even Hindi, you know, for the most part, but as you got into smaller languages, um, they didn't perform as well. And so we wanted to find a solution that would work uh, for most languages, not just a few. It's just a, a taking a step back, of course, you know, it might be easy to think that, well, text similarity, let's just start with word uh, overlap. And, and of course, this is one, uh, one option, right? We can just, you know, look for where are there words that, uh, that overlap or phrases, um, you know, take the, the size of that intersection over the size of the union. Um, you know, that gives you an idea of, of how similar things are. This is a very um, attractive idea. It's an easy idea, um, but ultimately it only gets at a very superficial level of similarity, right? It looks at the, the syntax, right? But not the, the meaning, not the semantics. And so here, you know, is a, another example. And these two examples, you know, drink tea often to prevent COVID uh, and you can cure coronavirus by gargling with hot water daily. Uh, both false, hasten to add, um, but also they don't share any words in common and yet you know, we can see that they do share some semantic similarity. They share some meaning similarity. Um, you know, hot water is related to tea in some way, drink and gargle, cure, prevent, often daily. Um, they, there's some semantic similarity here, despite the fact that they don't share any words. And so um, you'll likely come across things like word embeddings that can do this at a per word level. And you can um, look at how similar two words are to each other. That is an, a, a useful 
metric here and you can apply distant things like um, earth movers distance or word mover distance as it's been adapted to this um, but it doesn't scale particularly well to very large data sets um, ideally what we want to work our way down to are um, sentence embeddings or uh, yeah i'm going to call them sentence embeddings you might think of them as document embeddings as well um, but for for smaller um, documents basically so sentence embeddings we want to Put a whole message into one uh, dense vector, one numeric vector, and then we can just quickly compute the cosine distance between that vector and any other claim uh, that comes in. And ideally, we even want to be able to do that across languages. So these are, are two examples uh, that again match uh, semantically, but of course they have no words in common because they're not even written in the same language. Now, there are models to do this for English, um, and they perform fairly well. One model that we'll be using is called SBERT, the sentence uh, or sentence BERT. It's a, a BERT model um, to embed sentences as a whole. But we wanted to extend that to other languages. And so we took a bunch of parallel text and the translations, and we use those plus this original well-performing model uh, in English to train a new multilingual model. And the idea, if you like, is that you could uh, force the model to uh, keep its English embeddings and its understanding of uh, semantic similarity from the English model, but then drag all the representations of the other languages into alignment uh, with English. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. Um, but the idea, is, you know, at the end is that you'll end up with these dense vectors for each um, each message and that they'll be similar uh, to each other where the meaning is similar. And so here's the idea. It's a knowledge distillation technique uh, that we borrowed from, from this paper. And the idea is that you have a high quality uh, teacher model. So in this case, our, the sentence BERT model, and you have a lot of parallel data. Um, we used all of the data in the OPUS um, uh, translation uh, collection for Bengali, English, Hindi, Malayalam, uh, Marathi, Tamil, and Telugu. And, uh, and then a student model was this new XLMR model. And the idea here, this is known as, as a twinned network or a Siamese um, network, is that you have a teacher-student um, model. So the teacher model is already trained. That's our expert model. And we're going to use that. Um, and then as we train the new model, we're going to minimize two things. When it's an English sentence, we're going to force the English representation uh, to be as close as possible to the teacher model. Um, but when it's a student, uh, when it's a, a foreign language representation, uh, we're going to try to force it to be close to the English embedding of that from the teacher model again. And so when we know that um, the data coming in is translated data, so this makes sense to try to force the translated sentence uh, to be, have a similar embedding to where it is in the teacher model in English. And so using that, um, we were able to build a new model. And we, uh, we evaluated this model in a couple ways. Um, the first one was to think about this as a simple um, threshold classifier, right? Once you've embedded things, now we have a cosine. Uh, we can just use cosine distance and look at how similar uh, two vectors are to each other. And so we use uh, tenfold cross-validation, and we can show um, that this new model outperforms uh, our two other baselines in all of the languages, um, but most notably in, in these lower resource languages, right? I mean, the difference in English um, isn't massive, but the, the, you know, the differences here um, in, uh, say, Bengali or uh, Tamil, for instance, are better. Our performance also drops off in those languages, to be fair, um, but not as, as much. If we dig into just comparing these uh, a little bit to see what's happening, um, in general, what we're finding is that um, the Lebesse model, uh, which was trained mostly on translated data specifically, its, its whole goal is to try to find uh, similar sentences across languages um, that are likely translations of each other. It's very high precision, um, but it has a fairly low recall as it gets off to other tasks that um, maybe aren't direct translations of each other, they're just semantically similar sentences. 
Um, and so that's the challenge there, whereas um, Laser, this Facebook model, uh, didn't have as high precision um, on it, although it does have uh, very good recall. And we sort of um, ended up right in the middle of those two with a you know better recall uh, and precision uh, than, than either lower ones in each of those. Of course, we can, can go a bit further than that. Um, and so we can also think about not just the, the simple cosine distance, but we can start bringing in other um, elements into this. And so we put a simple um, Adaboost classifier on top of these embeddings where we look at the cosine similarity, but also features include the embeddings themselves, the length of the text, the difference in the text, um, et cetera. And we can show that we can boost uh, the output even further um, by including those features. And, you know, for comparison, we do that for all of the, the different language models as well. In the paper, we also talk about um, a sort of information retrieval approach for evaluating this. If you could just rank the nearest claims, what would that look like and how well? Um, again, the results there are a little less clear cut. Um, and so just to, for brevity, I'm going to skip those in, um, in the presentation, but they're in the full paper. You'll notice that everything I presented um, actually only evaluated within each language. And this is because for our evaluation data, um, we recruited speakers, native speakers in each of these languages and had them annotate pairs uh, for how similar they were. Um, but we didn't uh, have them annotate pairs across languages. Um, we didn't you know, particularly try to find annotators that could do all these various combinations of of languages. And so we don't have a formal benchmark for how well this performs in the cross-lingual case, but we should expect it to do fairly well because of the way that the, the model works. It's dragged all of these alignments, uh, all of these embeddings into alignment uh, across language. And so in practice, actually fact checkers are using this model now. And what we are finding is that it does match claims uh, across languages. We applied it to that um, Indian language, uh, the Indian election data set that I spoke on earlier. And again, as we look through the clusters that were created with this model, um, something like 96% of them, uh, all the messages were consistent with each other. And it was only um, a small percentage where it's like, okay, those things don't belong uh, in the same cluster. So yeah, some of the, the bigger implications are that uh, fact checkers are actually using uh, this system. We did it for Indian languages, but you know, the only thing we needed was a, a high quality English model uh, and a bunch of parallel text data, um, which is actually accessible for many languages. Um, you know, in contrast, if I really wanted to train a new model for semantic similarity, I would have needed a much larger data set, all hand annotated for how similar are our various pairs of items. We annotated data, but only for evaluation. Everything in our training, uh, we were able to make use of the existing uh, models that have been trained on large English corpora, already annotated, as well as this parallel data. Um, and then we released uh, these data sets. So our evaluation data sets uh, are released and as well as the model uh, itself. Uh, of course, you know, it's not just text. So what we've been working on more recently is um, are also these methods to match uh, other formats. So I've already spoken about matching images and the idea that you can, can basically um, work yourself down to a binary uh, bit array to represent an image and, and do some fairly quick uh, calculations on those uh, to find similar looking images. We do something similar uh, with audio uh, as well. And then video is a little bit more complex um, because of the temporal dimension, but ultimately it looks at the same idea. You hash um, the frames of the video, and then you slide one over the top of the other to, to see if you can find a match in, in where they maximize their correlation. Um, as a sort of weekend project, I ended up building Python bindings uh, for this, this existing library called TMK. Um, and so if, if you ever need to match videos, there's now a Python library for that. Um, and yeah, you know, of course, uh, so that's all within each one of these formats, each one of these modes, uh, as they're often called. And what we're really thinking now is about uh, matching across formats, or so multimodal 
matching. Um, some things you you know are, are a bit trivial. We think about okay, you can perform OCR on on text and photos. We can see if that already matches a claim. Or with video and audio, we can grab the audio track off a video and see if it's the same audio track uh, as a as an audio file uh, coming in. Recently, we've started doing transcription of video and audio, which allow us to compare to text. But actually, what I'm really excited about are thinking about methods that, again, represent audio in a vector space where we can use it. Um, and if we can align that vector space to the existing uh, vector models that we're using, then we might actually be able to say, oh, this piece of the audio aligns to this piece of text, uh, and we've never have transcribed the audio. Um, so there's some really exciting work happening in NLP, um, um, sort of textless NLP. And so it, it's audio uh, using much of the same approach of transformer models, um, but never converting it to text, actually working with it uh, purely in, in audio. And, and one example of this is, is called wave to vec uh, And there's a new model that um, leveraged that just recently where Facebook research again actually was showing they could generate um, uh, spoken audio, again, without ever having uh, an original transcript. The other thing that I'm, I'm very excited about, right, is how do we put um, human and machine intelligence together in a, you know, in an effective way? And so one of the things that we do in, um, in check in this Medan software is that when the model's unsure whether two things should match or not, we put them as suggested matches and we ask the fact checkers using the software to weigh in. Um, and this is an example of human and model in the loop. Uh, you know, we have a steady stream of, of data coming in. We have our machine model deployed, uh, but we want to constantly get uh, feedback from our from people using the model as to whether things should or shouldn't have matched. And then we can use that to uh, iteratively improve. Uh, the model. And so this is sort of what it looks like uh, in product. I'm sorry, I blurred out this, uh, this example, but you know, there's a, an item, it says, okay, here's a suggested match for that item. Uh, and you can simply click, oh yeah, that's a good match or not, um, and quickly go through a number of these and that will help the system um, learn in the future, as well as of course, actually just answering uh, that relationship um, uh, question for this item in particular. The last thing um, I'll, I'll just mention is that we've just kicked off uh, a big National Science Foundation project uh, in the US called FactChamp. Um, this is a long acronym for, for sort of fact checker academic collaboration tools uh, to combat hate uh, and abuse and misinformation online. Uh, something uh, on platforms, it must be. Anyway, then, uh, but the, um, the point of the, the project is to uh, really combine uh, and bring together academic research and practitioner uh, focused efforts, as well as community leaders uh, into this process of combating uh, misinformation. When I go to computer science conferences, um, you know, um, with one hat on and then I spend time with practitioners with a, a different hat on, I often see this sort of mismatch between uh, the challenges and the problems that fact checkers have uh, in practice and, and the types of data sets they're working with. Uh, and then, you know, the things that uh, that we maybe have in, in academia. And so I'm hoping that through this project, we're going to be able to find ways to better share data uh, from fact checkers to academics, uh, but also to make academic uh, outputs in, in tools developed um, by researchers uh, usable in practice uh, by fact checkers. And we really want to do all of this being informed by and, and led by uh, the needs of, um, of communities. And so um, we're going to be really working very closely in, in this project with Asian American uh, and Pacific Islander communities in the US. But in general, um, you know, we want to work with um, with all, all sorts of, of groups that maybe aren't as traditionally represented. So anyway, that's been a bit of a whirlwind tour, but I wanted to uh, to leave that uh, uh, here. Those are a few links and I'll, I'll happily share, uh, share these slides and, and the links um, uh, later as well, but um, looking forward to, uh, to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. So just to, to get a little bit of, of organization here, since we can't see each other, 
if you want to make a question, just raise your hand and then we, we can start making a question. Why are you uh, queen yourself? I have a, a quick question. So uh, Scott, did, did you guys use this, this like the information about the features about the tip lines, like number of requests or time to try to, to predict if the, the, the things are fake or not, like to use the, the, the features from the requests to try to label. Yeah, we haven't um, at this point. So a lot of this was, you know, in the first instance was trying to support uh, human fact checkers who um, were already doing this work, but trying to just make sure that the work they were doing had the largest impact possible and, and that, you know, there were things that could go into their prioritization uh, and decision of what to choose. But I think you're right. I think there are signals um, in the content, uh, both in terms of, you know, um, yeah, the volume coming in, but also, you know, if we can effectively find that content in other platforms as well, you know, WhatsApp isn't an island. A lot of this content moves across platforms. And so being able to, to locate that content uh, in other platforms as well, being able to see the reactions it's getting or, or the sources it's coming from uh, as well, I think there is um, definitely an opportunity to think about how those signals could, could indicate uh, whether or not something is is likely to be misinformation. Thank you. So we have two questions on the chat. I don't know if you prefer to read yourself or you want me to read for you. Sure. No, I can can read these out. Um, uh, so some of the most uh, compelling propaganda is deliberately misleading, but impossibly to uh, to comprehensively disprove. Yes, it may achieve a, a veil. Uh, of credibility using weasel words and motive suggestive language, ambiguous claims without explicitly propagating the false information. Can you as fact checkers ever hope to counter the dangerous effects of this type of material? Should we even try? So yeah, this is an excellent question. Um, in general, my, my interactions with most fact checking organizations is that they don't uh, engage in this content. They, they prefer to look at content that is uh, explicitly making a claim um, that can be checked and it can be, can be disputed or not. Um, but I, I think that this type of content is really important. And, you know, arguably it may even be a, a larger bulk of, um, of the content there. From my perspective, I think one thing is whether we can, again, identify fact checks or other trusted sources as providing additional context to it, right? Rather than, than being trapped in the idea of, is this content true or false, uh, sort of binary? I think what we wanted to do is move to the idea of providing context and saying, okay, uh, you know, without taking a, a, a position on, on the veracity of this, here's the context um, that you should know about this, right? And so maybe that way what's being suggested, you can, uh, can say, well, you know, no, that's, that's, you know, if you read it in context and you understand what it is, then you'll, you'll know that this doesn't, um, you know, isn't actually, um, uh, uh, like the, the inference is incorrect. Um, I think we've, we've been looking in other research. I've been working with Anna Wilson, a, a Russian linguist in, in Oxford, um, on TV programs and particularly looking at um, sort of pseudo news broadcasts from uh, RT or Al Jazeera and, uh, and similar. And there are certainly shows where, uh, again, certain uh, implications are trying to be made without saying them explicitly. And while those currently fall out of the, the sort of purview of fact checking, I think it's really important to identify those sorts of attempts and to call them out. And so um, I think there's a lot more to be done, uh, essentially. Uh, so I think we should try, uh, given given how prevalent such content is. But I think we need to do so, um, you know, in a careful manner that maybe doesn't seek to adjudicate the claim, uh, but seeks to provide uh, context and clarification to it. Uh, another question here was about: uh, Am I optimistic or pessimistic about the danger of misinformation in the future? Oh, uh, a mixed bag, I guess. Um, on the one hand, you know, I am happy that it's gotten more attention. And I think, you know, we've seen uh, platforms and others uh, take actions that prior to the pandemic, 
uh, just weren't in the repertoire. They, they, they weren't seriously considering uh, some of the, the policies that are now in place um, in terms of how they define misinformation or how broadly uh, they treat, say, COVID uh, misinformation in particular. Um, and so I do think that there's, you know, there's some opportunity there. There's also, um, uh, you know, in, in ever increasing uh, ways that we can, as computer scientists in particular, help to contribute uh, to this. So I'm, I'm excited by, by those possibilities. I do think it's a really uh, big challenge. And my, one of my worries is that uh, as the pandemic recedes from at least the um, sort of Western wealthy world, uh, that we're going to lose some of this focus on, on misinformation. Oh, Trump, that was, was long time ago. Uh, you know, coronavirus, that's gone now. Uh, and so that's not true. It's not gone. But, um, you know, if, if it happens in, in the sort of collective imagination, we might lose some of the momentum that's been building. Uh, Medan's been in this space since 2008 and, uh, you know, been dealing with a lot of misinformation outside of uh, the Western world. And, it, it, you know, more recently, it's come to the attention of a lot of Western uh, societies. But I, I think we really need to keep it in focus uh, in the global perspective. I saw a hand up, uh, perhaps. Yeah, Chico. That was me. Um, so the, I've got a question about the low resource languages. So one place where we see fact checking happen, happening sometimes is during debates and kind of political speeches in general. Um, do you think some of the methods that you described here could be used in a streaming way? Would it be hard to adapt them? Because I, I know fact checking can be done live, but I'm wondering about the methods that you described today, whether they could help live fact checking. Yeah. So again, I, I think on this idea that you know when a politician says something false once, they're liable to repeat it again. Um, and so being able to locate those those past fact checks, the things I've presented today aren't algorithmically. Um, determining, you know, veracity of claims, uh, but we are mining those databases. And a key part here was to try to do that in a computationally efficient manner. It's not that semantic embedding spaces are, you know, the best thing to do. Uh, in fact, I can probably get better performance by running, you know, pairs of sentences through a large language model and, and training it to, uh, to extract claims and predict their, their similarity, et cetera. Uh, but that simply just doesn't scale to large data sets, right? You know, to run something pairwise, you know, your sort of O of, it, of N complexity, square, you know, N squared complexity is not going to, um, uh, to scale up. And so, but cosine distance actually can because the, the vectors are pre-computed. Uh, you compute one new vector for your query and then you can uh, very efficiently run that. It's you know, embarrassingly parallel. And so I think these things can be used for that sort of real time. Uh, but there is this caveat for, you know, what's the right interface for this? How do you uh, support um, support this and make it uh, worthwhile during a, a live fact check? Yeah, or during a live debate, for instance. And uh, new one in here on, on whether children should be educated about misinformation at school. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I would say in general that uh, the sort of um, digital literacy uh, work, I think, is very important. Um, you know, being able to, to reason critically, uh, being able to uh, dig behind uh, some of the claims and look at sources, where are they coming from? Um, you know, those sorts of skills, I think, are important. It's an extension of the type of, of work that we do as academics, as you, you know, assess papers, whether in, in peer review or even published literature, and, and sort of, you know, think about, okay, how, how far should I trust this? How well should this generalize in an academic sense? You know, that sort of critical reasoning, I think, is very important. And the more that we can, can teach that across uh, the population and for people to be skeptical um, of, of some of the content online, I do think uh, that is, is a very important part of the puzzle. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. It was a very nice, and for, for me, it was very nice and optimistic presentation because we see that there is some some features some good news will help us to combat this this misinformation that are draining our our resource to make more more good than harm 
So thank you again. Thank you everyone for showing up. And remember, you can also suggest speakers or subject that you are you are trying to, to listen here in this seminar. This seminar is not mine, it's ours. It's for us to, to engage with some research. So give your, your suggestions and keep showing and share with whoever you want. Okay, thank you again. Thank you everyone. Okay. And thank you for the questions. It was great uh, to be able to join you today. Have a good good weekend. Bye. Bye.